Okay, everybody, let's get started. Hello, welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session, Teaching Pressbooks and Programmatic Implications, Part One with Lauren Ray. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director at the Open Textbook Network. If you're not already familiar with us, we're a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OTN. I'm serving as the facilitator for today's session and I'm joined by Barb Thies, our community manager who will be moderating questions for our presenter. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few more details with you. First, we are live tweeting. Join us on Twitter at open underscore textbooks. The hashtag for the summit is OTN Summit 20. This session is being recorded. The video transcriptions and slides will be posted on YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. If you would like to ask Lauren a question today, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. You have the option to make your question anonymous if you would like. And Lauren will pause throughout and check on questions. So feel free to post them as you think of them. I'd also like to point out you have the option for a live transcript if you like. There's a button there on the bottom right of your Zoom toolbar if you would like to enable that. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. Now, please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Lauren Ray. Lauren is the Open Education and Psychology Librarian at the University of Washington Libraries. In this role, she leads conversations around open educational resources, supporting faculty in creating and adopting affordable and openly licensed material. Lauren implemented and launched the UW Libraries Pressbooks platform for OER publishing and provides consultations and workshops on OER creation for faculty recipients of UW Libraries Open Textbook Awards and the greater university community. Lauren also co-chairs the UW OER Advisory Committee and was a Spark Open Education Leadership Program Fellow from 2018 to 2019. She provides support to the UW's Department of Psychology. And prior to her current role, she lived in Berlin, Germany, where she provided online research and instructional support to students, both at UW and international institutions and led qualitative user studies focused on improving online library services. She also led the opening and development of the UW Libraries Research Commons, a collaborative space dedicated to experimentation and interdisciplinary connection. Lauren's research interests include information equity, libraries as organizations, and critical information literacy. So today, Lauren is going to demo how she teaches Pressbooks to faculty, and tomorrow she'll discuss the programmatic implications she's learned um, from teaching this very workshop that you're going to experience today. So please join me in welcoming Lauren and I'll turn things over to you. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, welcome everyone. I am excited to um, start off our first of two sessions today on teaching press books and programmatic implications. Um, that was such a lovely introduction. I was sort of embarrassed by the amount of information I put in my bio. <laughs> um, but uh, welcome everyone. I'm Lauren Ray. I use she, her pronouns. And as Karen mentioned, I'm the Open Education and Psychology Librarian at the University of Washington Libraries. Um, so today what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, uh, OER support at the University of Washington to give some background um, and then talk a little bit about our Pressbooks um, platform um, that we are piloting at the UW um, and talk a, about how I've supported that platform um, through network administration as well as providing workshops. Um, and then I'm going to go through demoing the workshop, the introduction to Pressbooks workshop that I provide um, on Zoom for faculty at my institution. Um, and after that, um, talk a little bit about um, follow up, what I do after the workshops and kinds of responses I receive from workshop attendees um, and then have some time for questions. 
Um, and then tomorrow, I'm going to talk about um, talk about what the impact of the Pressbooks um, platform has meant for our OER support work at the University of Washington, um, and talk about some programmatic implications for OER publishing support that um, this, these workshops have brought up, um, and talk about service models and sustainability, um, and then get into more um, questions and discussions with everyone. Um, so first, just a little bit of background um, about uh, OER, Open Educational Resources at the University of Washington. Um, so Karen uh, gave my bio earlier, but just a little bit uh, about me. So I've been an academic librarian at the UW for 12 years. Um, and my first role focused on instructional design and distance learning services for students. Um, I created tutorials and streamlined libraries instructional content to meet the needs of students working online and experimented with um, person on the street video interviews to engage with students around how they were accessing and using information. Um, and starting in 2010, I led the opening and development of our research commons, which is sort of an experimental incubator space focused on interdisciplinary connections and providing graduate student specific services. Um, and that's where I launched the Scholar Studio series of grad student lightning talks, um, as well as the Collaborating with Strangers workshops. Um, and after that, I lived abroad for three years and continued to provide research support um, part time through my institution um, to students there and internationally. Um, and doing this work was a reminder of the lack of equity in education and the barriers faced by those unable to access online research and course materials that are locked down by paywalls or sometimes library licenses. Um, I was new to OER when I returned to Seattle in 2018, and I was excited to engage in work that would be about opening up access, but also supporting teaching and learning that had the potential to center upper, underrepresented student voices and dismantle hierarchies and learning environments. Um, having worked in these various sort of functional librarian roles over the years, I've always had these sort of like new, strange librarian roles. I was excited to figure out um, this sort of another new role and ways of translating the OER movement back to my colleagues and engage in this work as part of our learning organization. Um, one of my long term values as a librarian, regardless of the type of work I'm doing, is putting people over collections and platforms back into the work that's happening. Um, and I'm drawn to ways of creating ways for staff to tell the story of what they do what they value as a way for us as librarians to move from transactional to transformational work. So some context about my university. Um, the University of Washington is a large public research university. We have campuses in Seattle, Tacoma, and Bothell. Um, we have over 57,000 students and over 4,000 faculty. Um, and throughout our system, we have 16 libraries um, on the Seattle campus, as well as our Tacoma and Bothell campus and Friday Harbor. Um, we also have over 60 subject librarians in our um, system. So a little bit of background about open educational resources at UW. Um, back in 2015, um, colleagues of mine started an OER task force to look at um, ways of addressing um, access and affordability in higher education and the ways the libraries could address that. Um, and the task force looked at um, ways in which uh, we might address this issue and structures that the libraries might, um, initiatives and structures the libraries might create for supporting OER. And a steering committee was formed. Um, at that time, we also joined the Open Textbook Network um, and colleagues of mine who were working in OER at that time um, worked with student organizations at the UW on open textbook legislation and supporting them in that advocacy work. Um, the Open Textbook Network um, came out to Seattle and did a workshop with UW faculty at that time um, to raise awareness of open educational resources and open textbook authoring. Um, and we also got a Friends of the Libraries grant to start an open textbook pilot um, for funding um, faculty authoring of OER. In 2018, we created our first half-time open education librarian position. That's when I started in that role. 
Um, and we also got a second round of grant funding through an endowment um, for four faculty awards um, for creating or um, adapting OER. Um, and at that time, we also started our Pressbooks pilot. So when I started, um, this has kind of been my work over the last um, two years, um, which is um, providing support for the four faculty members at the UW who received um, stipend grants to author OER, um, providing administration um, and outreach through workshops of our UW Libraries Pressbooks Network. I co-chair our OER advisory committee that's made up of members from um, the UW Bookstore, um, from instructional design, learning technologies, accessible technology services, undergraduate student affairs, um, and other important units on our campus. Um, I also have um, created a series of workshops um, which are ongoing for subject librarian colleagues around um, open educational resources at the UW. Um, and we've also tried to build more community um, because we are a tri-campus system um, and we each, each of our campus libraries has sort of different initiatives happening to support OER. Um, we've been working over the last two years to try to build some community and programs around that by creating a Slack workspace for OER and email listservs. Um, and we've just started doing um, OER and Pressbooks community meetups online amongst our three libraries. Um, also important to note is that um, in 2018, our libraries launched our new strategic plan um, for 2018 to 2021. Um, so when I started, the strategic directions were sort of um, implemented and um, they were just starting to sort of um, uh, be out there in terms of uh, goals and um, our vision for the next few years. And in that, OER was specifically named for the first time. So under Enrich the Student Experience um, in our strategic plan, we have addressed the student affordability crisis by leading efforts on um, open educational resources and other approaches that improve access to resources and services. Um, so this is sort of the framework for um, where OER has been at our institution for the last two years. And when I started, um, and there's been a lot of really positive um, work that's been done to sort of um, advocate around OER um, and support faculty in um, authoring and remixing. Um, I should say that um, when we, um, when I started in my role, um, it was, I really got the message that um, both that the work of my colleagues um, prior to my starting um, in OER, we had really heard strongly from faculty at the University of Washington Seattle campus that there was a much stronger interest in um, OER creation over um, remixing or revising works. And so a lot of um, emphasis was placed in my position on how to support OER creation, open pedagogy, um, and publishing. Um, so a big focus on my role was building networks and faculty support for these things. Um, but there were some challenges at play, um, and I'll get more into talking a little bit about that um, tomorrow when I talk about sort of the programmatic implications of supporting Pressbooks in these workshops. So one of the challenges that I saw was that as a library, we weren't really fully committed to a publishing program. Um, we've obviously been doing lots of work over the years um, around scholarly communication um, and open access journal publishing support, as well as um, building support for digital scholarship and digital humanities. Um, so we had a lot of initiatives going on, but we weren't really as a library committed to saying like we are building a publishing program here. Um, and so uh, when our Pressbooks pilot was launched and when I was working on these initiatives, um, we we're still in this sort of cautiously um, waiting to see what, how these things would be received. Um, we also have limited um, IT support in the libraries. And so in order to really be successful in supporting faculty who are interested in authoring and publishing OER, um, I knew that I would need to um, work on building connections with our university IT, our Center for Teaching and Learning, and other campus units, as well as our library's ITS to see 
um, what kind of support might exist for um, sort of growing the platform and supporting the platform and providing um, that support for faculty. Um, another challenge that we had is that we really had sort of a lack of consistency in our libraries with past platform um, pilots, um, both in terms of like writing consistent terms of service and user guidelines, and also in terms of outreach. So we sort of had a tendency, which I think isn't uncommon in a lot of academic libraries, to sort of pilot a platform and the person who's supporting that is sort of um, doing that work, but maybe not doing it um, comprehensively with other um, platforms that are being supported um, in the libraries. And um, so there was sort of a lack of consistency there. Um, so a few more challenges that I also do see as opportunities um, is that I mentioned we launched our new strategic directions in 2018 and that was also when we sort of finished the first phase of a library's um, reorg. Um, and this reorganization created a new learning services unit in the libraries um, and that's where my position is located. Um, we also created a informalized a scholarly communication and publishing unit um, which encompasses things like copyright and open access um, and digital scholarship. And so um, my position was created within learning services because we acknowledged that the work that we wanted to do around OER was should be more focused on supporting faculty um, in, um, in, uh, in creating and authoring and in doing open pedagogy work um, and teaching differently with OER tools. Um, but we also recognize that there's obviously a strong tie with um, scholarly communication and publishing. And so um, I've maintained a lot of connection with my colleagues in that unit. Um, we also launched the UW Manifold um, uh, platform at the same time that we launched um, Pressbooks. Um, and Manifold um, is another um, uh, authoring tool or um, digital publishing tool. Um, and funding for that tool came about through a partnership between our digital scholarship librarians and um, the UW Press, which um, at that time was coming under the fold of the UW libraries. Um, and so one of the sort of challenges over the last two years in supporting our Pressbooks um, platform has been sort of distinguishing um, what Pressbooks does and sort of the um, vision for that work from um, another um, digital publishing tool manifold. Um, and that's something that I'll definitely dig into tomorrow um, is this idea of sort of developing a service model as you're going along. So when we launched Pressbooks, when I started, there was this sort of like, this is great, this is a platform that we can offer to faculty um, who are interested in OER. Um, but we didn't really have a firm service model. And so um, uh, something that's both a challenge and opportunity for me has been over the last two years to really pay attention to the kinds of questions that I get from faculty around Pressbooks um, and sort of what opportunities do those provide for building OER? Um, and then sort of what are the, what are the limitations on our services? What can we offer um, uh, given the staff staffing that we have and sort of pushing that forward iteratively. And I'll talk a lot more about that tomorrow. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our Pressbooks platform at UW. Um, so when I go into my demo of the workshop in a few minutes, I'm going to provide more information on what Pressbooks is. If you're not already familiar, I'm guessing a lot of people today are have at least some basics. Um, but just um, from a library manager and Pressbooks is online book writing, um, book authoring software. Um, it's driven by the Rebus Foundation. It's built on the WordPress platform and it has educational features that support open licensing, open education and interactivity. Um, I'm not, I don't work for Pressbooks, <laughs> um, but uh, just to give you kind of a breakdown of my understanding of the three ways in which um, Pressbooks can be used by educational institutions to support OER. Um, the first is the Pressbooks EDU network, which is what we use at the University of Washington. Um, 
And with this network, um, Pressbooks does the hosting. We get to have a limited number of network managers. So that's at my institution, myself, and two other librarians. Um, and we have the ability to configure access for our users, um, administer user accounts, and provide front-end support for our users. But Pressbooks does all of the hosting and updating of software. Um, we also, with Pressbooks, EDU get um, special educational features such as the H5P plugin and integration with our LMS um, and the benefit of being part of the EDU network. So that means we get to tap into a community of other um, primarily libraries and other institutions um, who are using Pressbooks EDU. We also get a very rapid response from the Pressbooks team um, and they provide personalized training um, to us through that network. Um, but Pressbooks also um, has other options um, for um, higher ed. So another option is that um, is self-hosting. Um, so Pressbooks is free and open source software, um, which means that anyone's welcome to download the source code and install it. Um, but um, so some institutions, if they have the resources and staff that are available to um, host uh, press books and do all of the updates themselves, um, then that's another option. <clears throat> and then finally, a third option is that some institutions could um, send individual faculty to pressbooks.com where those, they create their own books um, and um, just sort of uh, do that for self-publishing on their end. And that does not include those educational features. So, if you're more interested in that, reach out to Pressbooks and there's um, more information from that link um, in my slide. Um, so back to the UW. Um, so I mentioned that um, um, a few years ago we received grant funding to support faculty authoring of open textbooks. Um, and this funded um, work done by Sharon Kyoko and Justin Marlowe. Um, and publishing their book, Financial Strategy for Public Managers. And Sharon and Justin used the Pressbooks platform, which at that time um, was sort of in its early iterations. Um, and their book ended up being one of the first books published with the Rebus Foundation. Um, Justin and Sharon, um, this is the first open textbook in the field of public administration, and it's been really well received so far. Um, and so I have a quote here from Justin where he says, I've never had any desire to publish a traditional textbook. There are two or three decent ones in our field and it isn't large enough that you need multiple go-to texts. The goal was never to compete with those texts. I'm curious about open textbooks on multiple levels. I thought it would be cool to do for a variety of reasons. Transparency, openness, and accessibility are core values in our field. We're training the next generation of nonprofit CEOs, city and state managers. Um, and so when I talked with Justin about creating this book and his motivations, um, they were really clear that um, they felt like Pressbooks offered them a lot of flexibility and the timeline that they would need, um, and that it was a very easy to use platform. So as a result of their positive experience with Pressbooks, the UW Libraries um, uh, pursued funding for a pilot. Um, and received endowment funding to support the purchase of a two-year institutional subscription to Pressbooks, um, as well as funding for more awards. So that's a little bit of background. Um, so here's a, um, just a screenshot of our Pressbooks platform, which I um, set up and launched in um, the fall of 2018. So that's at uw.pressbooks.pub. And currently we have um, eight published books that are featured in our Pressbooks catalog, and those can all be explored online as well from that link. Um, I was sort of surprised today to see the number of users and books that we have on our network. So currently in our Pressbooks network at UW, we have 320 users and 290 books. I'll say that many of those are sort of practice books, they're unpublished. They're sort of um, test books that people may have created during my workshop. Um, and Pressbooks um, features do give you the ability as a network administrator to see some stats. So I can see sort of um, this growth of books over time on our network, including total books, um, books that are public as well as private. 
So a little bit about um, the workshops shop series that I've created. Um, so thus far, um, since the fall of 2018, I've offered 14 introduction to Pressbooks workshops for um, faculty at my university and three advanced Pressbooks workshops. Um, we have an average of about eight people who attend each workshop um, and they started out as being one hour, but now they're an hour and a half long. The goals of these workshops are to um, raise awareness of Pressbooks as an OER tool on my campus, show faculty what's possible with OER. So I think this often comes up for those of us who are supporting open education that um, faculty um, believe in saving students money. They want to make education more affordable, but that they really need to see a lot of examples of what that looks like and the diversity of um, possibilities. Um, so I wanted to sort of show off um, examples of different kinds of OER um, to sort of hook people and get them interested in OER through these Pressbooks workshops. The workshops also gave me the opportunity to learn um, what concerns and questions faculty had about open educational resources, um, authoring and creation, <clears throat> and also really to help me build use cases to help support requests that I might be making to my institution for future funding um, for Pressbooks, as well as things like um, as other OER initiatives like faculty grants. Um, so just a quick uh, breakdown of who's attended my workshop so far. So um, majority are faculty and staff at the institution. Um, we've also had a lot of students attend the workshops. These are primarily graduate students who are TAing a course, um, as well as librarians. And in terms of building the workshop content, so I initially developed this, my Intro to Pressbooks workshop as um, uh, for the four faculty members who received open textbook grants um, to sort of like welcome them to the grant and get them familiar with Pressbooks as a platform that they might use for authoring. Um, and then I sort of built that up from there and just started offering the workshop um, generally in a generalized format on my campus. Um, and again, the focus of the workshop is on um, different examples of what Pressbooks looks like at different institutions, um, um, along with easy hands-on exercises. And I have to thank um, all of these folks so, for providing some help and content and shaping these workshops. So Maria Gold, who um, is no longer at UC Berkeley, but at that time was the scholarly publishing librarian um, allowed me to use um, some of her slides and structure for the ways that she was delivering Pressbooks workshops. Um, also utilized um, open textbook network um, slides and content, um, as well as um, slides from Steele Wagstaff, who's currently in Pressbooks um, and formerly was um, at the University of Wisconsin, as well as shout out to Amanda Larson, who gave me a shout out at her presentation this morning. I'm currently at Ohio State, so I got a lot of, a lot of inspiration um, and uh, remixed some of the slides that Amanda had used when she was at the University of Wisconsin um, on teaching press books there. Um, and I mentioned earlier um, with the press books EDU network, we also get access to um, a Pressbooks community online. And this has also been really helpful for me in developing workshop content, as well as just planning programming for outreach and instruction um, for people on my campus. So I get to sort of tap into other Pressbooks network administrators at different campuses and ask them questions about how they're doing that kind of outreach, updates, um, reactions to that, um, questions that they might get for faculty. And that's been really helpful for me. In terms of outreach for the workshops, um, the, the primary way of my institution or my libraries that we um, get the message out to faculty is through our subject librarians. We're such a big institution and our subject librarians are really the first connection to faculty and their departments. So when I do Pressbooks workshops um, and I have sort of a schedule set, um, I email my librarian colleagues and um, beg them to <laughs> forward that information to their departments. Um, and I would say that's the primary way we've gotten um, faculty to take note of the workshops and attend them. 
I also add them to our campus events calendar um, and have a growing OER listserv, which is made up of faculty who attended those initial OTN workshops here, um, as well as people who have contacted me over the last two years. Um, for delivering the workshops, I have sort of an RSVP model. So I have a Google form where people sign up for the workshop. Um, and that allows me to, before the workshop, set those, um, set the attendees up with a Pressbooks account, make sure their account's working. Um, and then I also set up a practice book for them to work in um, during the workshop as sort of a sandbox. And you'll see that in just a few minutes. Um, and then I send them an email um, a day or two before the workshop that has a link to um, the, Zoom, the Zoom link for the workshop as well as instructions for them, making sure that they've all been able to get into Pressbooks um, and log in and be added to the book. I started, when I started offering these workshops, I did them in person. Then I did sort of an in-person online hybrid, which was um, very challenging. Um, and then I transitioned to doing them fully online in Zoom um, last year, which made it very easy during COVID and stay at home to just continue offering that content there. Um, and I think Zoom has been really great for, for me and um, uh, sort of allowing more people to attend and allowing more flexibility. And this is just a screenshot of the sign up form um, that I created in Google, um, in Google Drive for people to sign up for the workshops, giving kind of um, information about what they can see as well as um, links to sign up. Okay. So I'm about to go into demoing the workshop itself, but I just wanted to pause and see if there are any questions that have come in. Thanks, Lauren. There are not any questions waiting in the Q&A, but if anyone has anything they wanna clarify before Lauren starts her official demo and you all put on your faculty audience hats, <laughs> um, please drop it into the Q&A and we're happy to address it now. I'll also keep an eye on the Q&A as Lauren continues with her demo. So there is a question here, roughly how many subject librarians does your institution have, Lauren? We, great question. So we currently have around 60 subject librarians and that's across our three campuses at Seattle, Bothell, and Tacoma. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other questions right now. Uh, but I'll keep an eye on things. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Karen. Okay, so now I'm going to go into demoing the workshop, the Introduction to UW Libraries Pressbooks workshop. Um, <clears throat> during my demo, I have slides that say pause for questions um, that I built into the um, workshop itself as I deliver it. Um, and so during that time, I'll sort of pause and talk a little bit about the kinds of questions I get when offering it. Um, so I'll do a demo and then, and that's probably gonna be about the next 45 minutes or so. Um, and then I'll have time at the end for questions. So um, I'm putting on my magic librarian hat and becoming the, the workshop presenter now. Okay, so, um, so welcome everyone to this introduction to UW Libraries Pressbooks workshop. Um, my name is Lauren. I'm the Open Education and Psychology Librarian. I'm going to use she, her pronouns. Um, at the beginning of the workshop, I usually give a disclaimer that um, I that the session isn't being recorded, but I will be sharing out a link to the slides for everyone afterwards. Um, I also let everyone know that I'm not an expert in Pressbooks and there's probably questions that will come up during the workshop that I'm not able to answer today. Um, however, we received very um, rapid response from our Pressbooks support team. So if you do have questions, technical questions about Pressbooks during this workshop that I'm not able to answer, please um, send me an email and I'm happy to pass those along and get those answered for you. So normally during my Pressbooks workshops, I also have a Zoom moderator and I ask a colleague of mine 
um, to do the Zoom chat moderation. I found that that works really well for me. Um, sometimes I get a lot of questions from faculty as I'm going along and it really helps to have someone um, kind of helping me. Um, so today I put as a placeholder uh, my family's dog, Toby. Um, so just as a, as a cute picture um, there. So Toby will serve as the uh, fake Zoom chat moderator for today. Um, and I also give people during the workshop an opportunity to um, let us know who's in attendance by typing their name and department into the chat box so that I know who's there. Um, as I mentioned earlier with the RSVP, I have, um, it's pretty controlled in terms of who's attending, but sometimes people will share out the Zoom link with their colleagues. And so it's a helpful way for me to know who's actually attending the Pressbooks workshop um, and also to build kind of a sense of community in the space when I'm doing the workshop. Okay, so today I'm gonna to go over um, what is Pressbooks, um, giving you kind of an overview of that. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about open educational resources, which are sort of a, sort of the framework that the libraries has for providing the Pressbooks platform. We're gonna go into um, talking about some use cases of how Pressbooks has been used as a tool at other educational institutions as well as the UW. Then we'll go into having some hands-on time, um, actually creating and editing books within Pressbooks. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about how to add interactivity to your book once it's uh, made public. Um, we'll talk a little bit about licensing and Creative Commons, as well as accessibility in Pressbooks, and leave some time at the end for questions and discussion. Um, so what is Pressbooks? Um, Pressbooks is basically easy to use online book writing software. It's built on the WordPress platform. So if you're already familiar with um, editing in Pressbooks, it shouldn't look too different to you. Um, and Pressbooks is used by individual authors, libraries, educators, and publishers. Pressbooks is driven by the Rebus Foundation. They're based in Montreal, and they're big supporters of open publishing and affordable education. And on the right here is just a screenshot of what a book in Pressbooks looks like. We'll be looking at a lot of these in just a few minutes. Some important features of Pressbooks. Um, it's a tool that allows you to write, edit, and publish digital works and host those works online. You can then export the works that you create um, in different formats, including print and digital PDF, as well as EPUB and Mobi, so that your readers can read them on an e-reader, like a Kindle or a Nook. You don't really need design skills in order to create a really great looking book in Pressbooks. You can choose from professional templates that do that work for you. If you've already created something in Word, for instance, um, you can easily import that content into Pressbooks and turn it into um, an online book. With Pressbooks, you can have several collaborators work on the same book and give them different roles and permissions. So I know, um, for instance, if you're a faculty member and you're interested in using Pressbooks um, uh, to create course materials, you can designate um, a student or a colleague or a TA to work with you in the book and give them different um, permissions within the book, such as subscriber or editor or co-author um, within that book. So there's a lot of um, control that you have there. Pressbooks also allows you to apply different licenses to your whole book or to individual chapters. We'll talk a little bit more about licenses um, in a bit. Um, but for instance, you can apply a license to one chapter of your book that makes it quite open and then give another chapter a more restrictive um, license in terms of how you want others to use it. Um, another important feature is that uh, Pressbooks offers um, support for LaTeX as well as non-English languages. So a little bit about the University of Washington Library's Pressbooks pilot. Um, so we um, started this pilot in 2018 and we were just um, given new funding to extend that pilot to 2020, I'm sorry, 2022. Um, and um, I'm very hopeful that we will be able to continue the Pressbooks pilot um, past that time. But one of the reasons we invested in the Plus Pressbooks platform is that um, it doesn't really lock you into, um, into that platform. So 
books that you create in UW Libraries Pressbooks can easily be migrated elsewhere. Um, if for some reason we're not able to continue funding for Pressbooks, you would be able to take the content that you create in Pressbooks out and host that elsewhere. Um, so it doesn't create kind of Pressbook specific formats when you create a book in Pressbooks. Currently, account setup is through the UW Libraries, so I set you up with an account before you join the workshop today. Um, if you have a colleague or student who wants a Pressbooks account, please encourage them to reach out to me. Accounts are only for current UW students, faculty, and staff, and there's no limit on the number of books that you can create. So you can go wild after today and just create lots of books in the system um, and play around with it um, with your new Pressbooks account. Um, so why did the libraries invest in Pressbooks? Um, primarily, this was a way for us to help um, reduce the financial burden for students um, that um, as a result of the sh um, sharp increase in textbook prices. Um, so we know that um, textbook prices have increased three to four times the rate of inflation over the last 30 years. And we know that students at our university struggle with paying for textbooks. So we wanted to support Pressbooks as a way for faculty um, at the university to create um, resources that would be free of cost to students to use. In addition to that, um, Pressbooks is a platform that allows educators to create, remix, modify, and share materials to suit their own teaching needs, um, as well as provide culturally specific context and localized knowledge. Um, so you're not locked into um, the um, into, for instance, with a commercial textbook publisher um, to um, catering to those needs and requirements, you really have a lot of control over um, how you're publishing the timeline that you want to publish under um, and updating and suiting that material for your own course. Um, Pressbooks also is a tool that allows um, us to think about centering student knowledge through open pedagogy. Um, so I'll show you in a bit some examples of um, Pressbooks books um, that involve student collaboration. Um, and so this is a tool that allows um, students to see themselves reflected in the course in the textbook um, and really gets at this idea of students as not just consumers of information, but as um, contributors to information. So I mentioned earlier that Pressbooks was created by the Rebus Foundation. Um, I did also really want to mention and give a shout out to the Rebus community. Um, so this is an online space um, that's a place, um, if you are interested in Pressbooks and you're attending the workshop today because you're interested in creating an open textbook or another kind of course material that's openly licensed, I really encourage you to look at the Rebus community. Um, they can be a great way of um, getting your project out there beyond um, our institution. Um, a place to recruit collaborators that might include authors, co-editors, peer reviewers, etc. Um, a place to ask questions and seek advice and also a discussion space for um, publicizing your project. Um, so a little bit about open educational resources. Some of you may already be familiar with this, but this is sort of, as I mentioned, kind of the framework by which we um, invested in the Pressbooks tool. <clears throat> so open educational resources are high quality teaching, learning, and research materials that are free for people everywhere to use and repurpose. A lot of times when people talk about OER, they think about open textbooks, but OER does not have to be limited to textbooks. Um, so a few examples here are um, student authored works, videos, course modules, and entire courses. Um, and many times, um, I think because we're maybe familiar with the term open access, we sort of focus on the free side of things. Um, but just to be clear, um, when we're talking about OER, um, we're talking about something that's both free of cost to students and that comes with permissions um, that allows it to be freely edited and modified and distributed. Um, so, when we're talking about this um, in the OER world, we often talk about these five R's, which were um, described by David Wiley, a leading figure in the OER movement. And these are the permissions um, that come with um, open educational resources that allow them to be um, 
flexible and reuse. So um, retain the right to make, own, and control copies of the content, um, reuse the right to use the content in a wide range of ways, revise the right to adapt, adjust, modify, or alter the content, for instance, translate it into another language, um, remix the right to combine the original or revised content with another material um, to create something new, um, and redistribute the right to share copies of your original content, your revisions, or your remixes with others. So these are the sort of permissions that um, you can give a work that you're creating in Pressbooks or another platform um, that allow it to really be an open educational resource. Um, I often uh, get questions from faculty about kind of, well, aren't library resources free? How is this different from, you know, using an ebook or um, a journal article online? Um, and I find this chart to be helpful um, in terms of breaking down that free and permissions. Um, so with commercial textbooks, we know that the cost to students can be quite expensive. Um, we also know that commercial textbooks um, come with quite restrictive permissions for faculty and students, right? So you can't, um, you can't really do very much with them in terms of copying and reusing them um, beyond that one instance. With library resources, while they're free of cost to students, um, they also come with quite um, restrictive permissions. So libraries um, resources are often restricted by licenses, agreements that are made between the libraries and the um, publisher or vendor that doesn't allow um, much use beyond um, that individual user. So especially now during COVID times, talking with a lot of friends who are depending heavily on for instance, um, audiobooks or e-videos through the public library. Um, I hear a lot of, you know, oh, I wish I wish I could check out this book for longer. Um, there, you know, all these sort of digital tools that restrict access, um, and a lot of that has to do with the license that um, uh, that stipulates a very restrictive use for libraries in terms of how users can use it. Um, with open educational resources, however, um, the cost is free for students, and then it also comes with quite liberal permissions. Um, so um, you have the ability to reuse and share and remix that work um, really um, in quite open ways. And finally, I just wanted to mention open pedagogy, which is a concept that um, leverages the open nature of OER to facilitate learning. Um, so open pedagogy is sort of the, um, uh, the teaching practice that really makes use of OER. Um, with open pedagogy, there's an emphasis on community and collaboration, sharing resources, ideas, and power. Um, and we're talking here about instances where students are also a part of creating open educational resources, including books and press books. Um, and again, I'll show some examples of those in a minute. Um, and so with open pedagogy, student work can have a connection to the wider public. So some examples of open pedagogy are having students adapt, remix, or build open educational resources, having them annotate and build bibliographies for course readings that can be used in future classes. Um, and sometimes I like to use this example. When I was an undergraduate student, I um, this is a, a picture of a paper that I wrote as an undergrad back in 1995. I found this in my basement and it had gotten a lot of water damage. Um, and so with um, open pedagogy and OER, we often talk about this concept of the disposable assignment versus the renewable assignment. Um, so with this paper that I wrote many years ago, this is a good example of a disposable assignment. It's also literally disposable because it was just in a box in my basement. Um, but with this, um, you know, at that time, when I was um, writing a paper for a class, I would write it on my word processor, print it out, turn it into my professor and get a grade. No one would ever see that paper besides myself and my instructor. Um, there wasn't really a connection with what the research that I had done for the paper um, with kind of a greater public. It was just really 
sort of siloed into that course and um, my own relationship with the, uh, with the class and the professor. Um, and with open pedagogy and OER, um, we like to talk about this concept of a renewable assignment. So because of the tools afforded by the internet, as well as things like um, press books and OER tools, um, students are able to create assignments or instructors are able to create assignments for students that allow that work to have a connection with the wider public um, and be built on um, over the years and over quarters and semesters. So that was a lot of sort of background there and before we're going to jump into um, press books. Um, so I'm going to take a step back from my demo workshop <laughs> and just see if there are any questions that have come in before I continue with the demo. <coughs> um, I'll take a look at the Q&A. Yeah, we do have a few questions, Lauren. So a follow up on um, the question about subject librarians at UW. How many other librarians does your institution have working on OER who are not also subject librarians? Great question. So on my campus at Seattle, I am the only one, and it is half of my position um, at our Bothell and Tacoma libraries. Um, there's no one who has open education as part of their title. However, there are um, librarians at those campuses who are sort of collaboratively working on um, open education efforts. Um, and at each of those campuses, there is a, um, a librarian who serves as the network administrator along with myself for press books. Thank you. And mm -hmm. have a request for your workshop slides, not today's presentation slides, but the workshop slides that you use. Will you be willing to share those? Uh, yes. I, yeah, I, I need to work on them and probably check in with Pressbooks and make sure they're all updated and everything, but I'd be happy to chat about that afterwards. Great. And is there anyone in your library with coding experience? Do you think that that's necessary when having a Pressbooks instance? Um, it's definitely not necessary with the Pressbooks EDU. Um, uh, network that we have. So I don't answer any questions about coding. I don't use that experience at all. Um, so it really is uh, sort of supporting um, instructors who are creating things in sort of a WYSIWYG editor. Um, and the few times that I've gotten questions from faculty that involve like <clears throat> CSS or something more detailed that I can answer, I can forward that on to the Pressbooks team. But because we have the sort of software as service um, package from Pressbooks, um, we don't really need to do that. I'm not setting up the network. I'm not doing any updates to Pressbooks. It's all handled by the Pressbooks team. And have you had to deal with support for other author collaborators that might be outside of the UW system? Like, would you create an account for someone at another institution, for example? No. <laughs> um, I'm only providing support for um, University of Washington faculty and instructors. <laughs> and if a faculty member creates a book in Pressbooks and decides to take it elsewhere, would the original institution, your institution, be able to continue to host it as well, especially if other faculty are using it? That's a great question and something that we haven't actually gotten into yet because our network is pretty young. Um, so faculty member has control over the book and if they wanted to take it elsewhere, they would be able to do that. Um, we are still, I would say, in the process of, um, and this is something I'll talk about tomorrow, sort of setting up what, the, what this is gonna look like long-term in terms of um, hosting books on our site and um, how to kind of come to that agreement with a faculty member. So um, I guess the question is, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> um, yeah, fair enough. Um, there's a question here whether Pressbooks has a catalog for all the Pressbooks made publicly available by different institutions. And I believe they're working on this. Yes, yeah. Details, Lauren, but I think, you know, that is a goal that they have. Yes, and it's very exciting and something I'm really looking forward to, to seeing, so. 
And we have a, a couple more questions here. One I think is uh, about ownership. If a professor publishes in press books, can they still edit it if they leave the institution or would they need to download and re-upload it into another instance or another using another platform or format? Um, that's a great question and also something that we haven't come across yet. Um, so I think that's something the Pressbooks team would probably be better at, at answering. Okay. And Lauren, you might cover this later. So if so, we can put a pin in okay. it. How much editorial support do you offer your Pressbooks authors or do you limit your support to more platform technical side? Yes, that's definitely going to be talked about tomorrow, but I would say very limited or pretty much no editorial support. We really have sort of a DIY model where faculty are responsible for that. And um, just a couple more that I think will be pretty fast. Um, yeah. Are these books listed in the UW library catalog and related? Do you include your instance in the UW discovery engine? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's a, a process that also kind of gets into the programmatic implications and that I'll talked about yesterday, but yes, we've, we've started adding those to our catalog. Um, and, and we do have a scholarly communication. <laughs> Sorry. I'm so, glad you yeah. see them all there. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're probably anxious to keep rolling here. So I think we covered a lot of questions. Great. Yeah, yeah I'll jump back in um, and Yes, and Marilyn's question about assuming that we don't allow partner faculty to have access to our Pressbooks instance, that's true. So only University of Washington faculty have access to ours. Um, okay, I'll jump back into the demo and try to kind of get through the rest of the demo and final questions. So um, great. So now I'm putting back on my workshop hat. <laughs> Um, so now I'm going to go into talking about some, showing some examples of how Pressbooks has been used. Um, so um, first wanted to mention this example of an open textbooks created here at the University of Washington by one of our faculty in the Evans School um, called Financial Strategy for Public Managers. It was authored by Sharon Kyoko and Justin Marlowe. Um, and um, usually at this point, I sort of open up the live site to show um, how the Pressbooks book looks like on the web. Um, and I point out the, um, the sort of look and feel of the homepage and um, the Creative Commons license that's given there. Um, and I talk a little bit about how Justin and Sharon wanted to create a book that would really meet the needs of students in their class. Um, and allow um, a resource that wouldn't have to be paid for and that could be updated um, according to the needs of the class over time. Um, another example, here's an example of an open textbook created by Christy Miller at the University of Minnesota um, called Introduction to Design Equity. It highlights the pitfalls and potentials of <clears throat> design as a tool for building just social justice. Um, Dr. Miller is a professor in the landscape architecture program at UNM. Um, and I had an opportunity to um, hear Dr. Miller talk about the creation of this book at a conference I attended last year. Um, she said that she knew she wanted to do a textbook and that creating one online made more sense because she wanted it to be accessible. Um, she also said of the project that students are graduating with a lot of debt. Um, designers don't make a lot, of her a lot of money and half of her class are design majors, so they're going to go um, have it on their shelf later and refer to it. So it really made sense to create it as an OER. Um, she felt that Pressbooks allowed her to use images and to create a really nice um, looking online book. Um, and all of the examples that I'm going through now are freely available for everyone to check out um, after the workshop today online. Um, sorry, this slide is out of order, but going back to financial strategy for public managers, um, I mentioned earlier the Rebus um, community, and I just wanted to show you like a screenshot of the project summary page from financial strategy for public managers. So this is the page where <clears throat> Justin and Sharon had logged their book um, to kind of describe the book and get the word out about the book, as well as um, call out needs for help that they had with um, helping the book meet accessibility standards and marketing and promotion in other classrooms. Okay, moving on to other Pressbooks examples. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about remixing and revising earlier. 
This is an example um, on the left is a screenshot from the OpenStax project out of Rice University. If you're not already familiar with that, it's a really fantastic um, collection of um, peer-reviewed, openly licensed, and completely free um, textbooks that are available for students. And on the right is an example of a book created in Pressbooks um, by instructors who took content from um, one of the openly licensed um, OpenStax books um, and um, remixed it and mixed it up with their own content to create this environmental biology textbook using Pressbooks. Um, and in that book, you can see um, kind of attribution to the OpenStax books as well as other textbooks that they use to revise and create that. I mentioned earlier student authored works. This is a really fantastic project <clears throat> from the University of Wisconsin. It was written by students in Anne Smart Martin's um, art history class there. It was written over two semesters to accompany the exhibit of a new historical museum opening in a nearby town. Students in the class research different items to understand their history and the story of their users. The book includes images, descriptions of objects, audio, and other multimedia. So this is entirely written um, and researched by students in a class and can be updated over time. I think it's a really fantastic um, resource to take a look at if you're considering this kind of work with Pressbooks. Um, this is another example of a student authored work. Um, it's the anthology um, Antología Abierta de Literatura Hispana, the Introduction to Hispanic Literature um, from Dr. Julie Ward's <clears throat> Intro to Hispanic Literature course at the University of Oklahoma. Um, with this project, um, Dr. Ward had students in her class select um, <clears throat> important text in the public domain um, and um, compiled those into press books and write um, annotations and introductions about the text um, in this book. And so this is openly licensed, freely accessible, and evolving over time. So I've mentioned a full kind of a few examples that are like full books, but I also want to emphasize that Pressbooks doesn't have to be used for that. I think this is a really good example from the University of Minnesota of a class study guide um, from a pharmacology course. Um, where I believe a, a TA for the class had created this study guide in print that was sort of color coded with these really fantastic illustrations um, and decided to put it into press books to make it more um, accessible um, and easier than, you know, photocopying, photocopying and distributing this um, every quarter. I'm just going to skip through this. Um, so here at the University of Washington, um, we have this um, an introduction to Portuguese, which was recently published in press books from Eduardo Viana da Silva, um, a lecturer and the program Portuguese program coordinator here. Eduardo wanted to create a Brazilian Portuguese textbook for students who have English as their first language, but also have it be applicable to high school students and adults learning Portuguese, including immigrants in Brazil. Um, he said he felt uncomfortable asking students to pay $200 for textbooks, and he also wanted to respond to the lack of Brazilian Portuguese instruction as opposed to European Portuguese, which is covered more frequently in educational textbooks. Because it was developed as an OER, Eduardo was able to incorporate meaningful audio exercises reflecting daily life in Brazil. He actually went to Brazil and did recordings of students' voices, providing a culturally relevant experience with authentic voices. Also wanted to highlight here at the University of Washington um, this how to FOIA guide, which was created by Emily Willard, um, a UW Center for Human Rights graduate research fellow. She had been offering workshops on how to submit <clears throat> Freedom of Information Act requests for many years and wanted to um, create, um, put her guide into a more accessible and reusable format and she used Pressbooks to do that. And she said, I felt strongly about creating an opportunity for anyone who wanted to learn to use the FOIA would have the basic skills to use this important tool of democracy and government oversight. Finally, I wanted to highlight two examples of student authored works here at the University of Washington. So on the left is a student authored zine project called Badass Women of the Pacific Northwest. It's a student authored zine project created in the UW Bothell course, Rad Women in the Global South led by Professor Julie Shane. And um, Dr. Shane worked with librarians Penelope Wood and Denise Hatwig. Um, and students authored and did all of the artwork for this zine, which is really incredible. And I um, encourage you to take a look at it. 
Um, it's a resource that fuses multilingual poetry, art, and writing to highlight badass women, femme, or envy non-binary people from the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> and on the right, um, I worked recently with um, Professor Rick Bonus in American Ethics Studies. Um, his students authored this critical Philippinex American Histories and Their Artifacts project. Um, um, uh, Professor Bonus um, regularly had an assignment in which students would work with our Burke Museum um, selecting artifacts related to Philippinex history there. Um, and in the past, he's had students create posters for their final project. Um, but this year, um, we worked to compile those resources into a book and press books. Um, I led training for students on press books and our copyright librarian um, led training on open access, creative commons, and students' rights and responsibilities as open scholarship authors. So that's the end of my examples. You can explore other press books OER currently for my LibGuide. Um, I have links to finding OER and open textbooks there. <clears throat> and press books will be coming out with a directory of, um, uh, that will allow you to explore more specifically press books only created OER. So normally at this time I pause for questions um, and sometimes I get some questions about the examples that I've gone over, whether they're truly open, how open are they, what is the licensing, that sort of thing. But usually people are pretty ready to dig into the online hands-on part. So I kind of go into that then. So getting started with press books during this section, I cover um, editing, adding images, organization, themes, and exporting. At this time, I have everyone log in to our Pressbooks platform, and I take them to the dashboard for the book that I've set up. Um, so this is, um, again, I mentioned earlier that before each of my Pressbooks work workshops, I create like a demo book, and then I add each of the faculty members who have signed up for the Pressbooks workshop to that book as an editor. Um, and then I go through, so I've created this kind of fake book here with Bart, Homer, Marge, and Lisa as the <laughs> authors, the faculty, member who are, faculty members who are attending. Um, I take them into um, the text editor in Pressbooks and kind of show them <clears throat> basic features of creating and editing text within um, Pressbooks here. Um, I talk about how in Pressbooks, um, let me actually just bring this up here. So I can minimize my screen. And so during this part of the workshop, I would um, go into looking at uh, Pressbooks Live in the browser and kind of explore um, clicking on a chapter, um, adding content to that, cha that chapter there. Um, I would also talk about adding media, um, using this at media link and sort of how to add an image and add alt text for that. I generally highlight as well um, status and visibility over here, letting instructors know that um, on the chapter level, they can designate whether or not they want their final book, um, that chapter to be visible to anyone on the web or to require a password. Um, as well as um, whether they want that chapter to be exportable or not. So I point out that um, as an instructor, you may want to have parts of your book be password protected, for instance, if they have answers to a quiz or something like that, um, and to have others fully open. Um, I also talk about um, at the bottom ways of sort of um, tracking um, comments and edits. So if you're having multiple people working on the book, that's helpful. Um, and I show the um, preview link, which gives you a preview of what the chapter um, will look like. So those, I kind of just go over the, the basics pretty quickly um, there. And um, I also talk about, again, adding media, um, adding a YouTube link. Um, Pressbooks has the ability for you to just add a link to a YouTube or Vimeo video. Um, that's hosted elsewhere and it shows up sort of immediately within, uh, within the book. Um, and then I go into this practice exercise. So I have faculty go to the dashboard for the demo book I created. I have them click add to create a new chapter, entering their name as the chapter title, and then adds an interesting fact about themselves. So I give people online about um, 
five minutes to do that um, and to play around. And that's usually fun because then at the end um, of that, I can go back to the dashboard for the book I've created and we can all sort of scroll through and look at the chapters that everyone in the workshop has created um, and see what that would look like published. And it's, it's usually kind of a fun time for people to like get to know each other um, through creating the chapters in this book. Okay. Um, then I point out chapters and organization, um, which is another feature of the Pressbooks um, left side navigation, um, pointing out how you can um, change the organization of your book um, and front and back matter and different um, types of content within Pressbooks. <clears throat> I also go into talking about the themes. So currently Pressbooks has 21 different themes with different fonts and styles. Um, and that can be changed um, when you go to appearance in your book. Um, and then I have everyone go into practicing creating a new book. Um, and I, again, I kind of give them these instructions and then give them five minutes in the Zoom call to do that on their own um, and then come back and um, take their questions in that process and pointing out kind of what the difference is when you create a new book and um, in Pressbooks and you have administrator level privileges so you have the ability to kind of do more versus when you're an author or an editor in the book, the sort of practice book that I had created earlier. Um, and then I have everyone practice doing some things in the new book that they created, like activating a new theme, adding book info. Um, I talk about um, the book info page where you can um, explore or add a license to your book, um, et cetera. Uh, and then I go into demoing how to import and export in Pressbooks. Um, so this usually also is kind of an ooh ah moment where I take a very simple um, Word document that I've created um, and show how I have um, applied um, a normal style to the text within that Word document um, and then heading one to the various headings within the book. Um, and then I demo importing that Word document into Pressbooks um, and then exporting it um, as a digital PDF. And that whole process takes <clears throat> something like three minutes. And it's usually quite impressive to show instructors what that looks like to go from a simple Word document where I might add in a video or add in um, an image um, to something that really looks like a very nicely formatted um, um, e-book. E so sorry to kind of fly through that. I know we're getting close to the end of the time for this um, webinar, so I just want to make sure we have more time. <clears throat> Um, at this time, I usually pause for questions, and there's usually a lot of questions about what we just did, creating new books, um, and kind of the mechanics within Pressbooks. And then I go into giving a quick overview of other tools that can be used with Pressbooks. <coughs> so um, I talk a little bit about H5P, H5P being an open source tool that allows you to add things like quizzes, slideshows, and interactive video and hotspots to your Pressbooks book. Um, I cover H5P in the advanced Pressbooks workshop that I offer. So this is usually just like a quick highlight of it. And if you're interested in more, sign up for the advanced Pressbooks workshop. Um, and then I show what H5P looks like in a textbook. So this is a good example of this um, Portuguese language textbook from the University of Wisconsin that has a quiz embedded. I'll usually open that live and kind of demo what that looks like to interact with, um, with that quiz in a live book in Pressbooks. And then I talk a little bit about um, hypothesis, um, using the hypothesis tool with Pressbooks for highlighting and annotation, um, and um, talk about what that might look like um, as an instructor, why you might want to turn on that feature in your Pressbooks book. Um, so um, faculty can, or textbook creators, authors within Pressbooks can use Hypothesis to <clears throat> increase um, collaboration between authors and editors. You can use it as a way of taking personal notes, and you can also use it as a way to motivate students to engage with readings. 
and I show kind of a screenshot example. For instance, this is um, out of the University of Wisconsin, an example in which an instructor put um, many public domain texts that dealt with American democracy into a press books book and then used hypothesis as a way, um, sort of an assignment for students to um, comment on and highlight and um, ask questions about um, specific passages within those texts. So again, this is usually a very brief, here's what H5P and hypothesis look like. If you want to know more about using this in Pressbooks, sign up for the advanced Pressbooks workshop or um, look at the Pressbooks user guide. And finally, I um, give kind of a shout out to Pressbooks integration with um, our learning management system, Canvas, um, and the fact that um, Pressbooks chapters can be um, shared in Canvas courses, which helps ensure that student data isn't shared outside of Canvas. Um, I'll talk about a little bit about this tomorrow, but I haven't actually until very recently gotten questions about this. I think most of the faculty who have attended my workshops are kind of like just starting to think about creating materials in Pressbooks or just getting started with a project and they really maybe haven't thought through how they're going to use it um, in a course or what that might mean in terms of um, grading content or using those interactive elements like hypothesis and H5P. <clears throat> but I am definitely seeing an uptick in that since COVID. So I usually do the slide and kind of say, more to come, ask me questions. <laughs> um, I then demo, so now I'm moving into copyright and open licensing. So oftentimes when um, we're talking about press books and um, creating books and publishing them and sharing them online. Um, you as um, authors may have questions about copyright and what this open licensing means. So just a quick review, <clears throat> US copyright law protects an author's right over your original creative works. So things like research articles, books, um, manuscripts, etc. Most copywritten works um, come with an all rights reserved uh, protections, which means that you can't, they can't be used without permissions from the works right holder, which is usually the creator. <clears throat> However, one way to get permissions to use someone else's work is through a license. A license is a statement or contract that allows you to perform, display, reproduce, or adapt a copywritten work under specific circumstances. So I've mentioned a few times Creative Commons and open licensing. If you're not already familiar with Creative Commons, it's a very simple way to tell others how they can use your work. It's a, an open licensing system and it comes with four conditions with um, six possible licenses. So I'm getting close to the end, so I'm going to kind of breeze through this, but at this point I go over the four components of Creative Commons licenses and what those mean. Um, and then I talk about the different ways in which those can be combined, as well as the choose a license tool that's offered by the Creative Commons site, um, pointing out that the no derivatives license doesn't allow for remixing or revising, which is a significant benefit of OER. Um, and then again, I remind them how to add their license in Pressbooks um, and give a quick overview of the clone a book feature which allows you to um, <clears throat> clone and adapt other openly licensed books that are created in Pressbooks. I also demo this more in the advanced workshop, so I mentioned that at this point. <clears throat> and finally, um, accessibility in Pressbooks. Um, so Pressbooks has features that help um, steer you towards creating accessible books. However, as a book author, it's really important that you keep in mind um, best practices for creating works that you're going to share online in ways that are going to make them more accessible to your users. So here's a list of things that you should keep in mind. Um, fortunately, at the University of Washington, we have a lot of really fantastic resources. Um, and I've also linked this OER accessibility resources guide from <clears throat> UBC here. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Okay, kind of going through very quickly the end. Um, so at this point, I start to conclude the workshop and try to open a discussion. How do you see yourself using Pressbooks? What unanswered questions do you have? And what kind of support would you like to see? Um, this is when I would take questions from faculty. Um, I also point out the Open Educational Resources Guide at the University of Washington, Seattle. 
Um, we have one at Bothell um, and our um, digital collections librarian there, Denise Hatwig, um, has also created a really great guide on open student work. Um, and then I also point out our OER guide at UW, UW Tacoma, as well as our copyright and licensing guide from our copyright librarian. And followed by many, many links. I'm a librarian, so I have to have like a lot of links to further information at the end of my presentation. Um, <clears throat> so books that have been mentioned earlier, um, as well as um, tools for hypothesis and H5P. Okay, so that was the demo. <laughs> um, and just very quickly, um, after each of the workshops, I send a link to the slides along with a feedback form, answer questions that came up, um, add those attendees to my listserv. Um, in general, the feedback has been they really appreciate active learning. They appreciate having really diverse examples with Pressbooks. You know, I get, I didn't know so many things could be done with Pressbooks. I really like being able to have hands-on time to play around with it. People really appreciate having a Zoom chat moderator. I think if you're thinking about doing these at your own institution, that's important to have somebody helping you out. And people really love H5P. That's a big takeaway. <laughs> Um, how they'll use Pressbooks. Um, people mention, again, like I'm kind of at the beginning here, but I'm thinking about this for a classroom project. And there's also usually generated a lot of interest in student created works. So tomorrow I'm going to kind of go into a little bit more of the programmatic implications. These are the sort of questions that I get during these workshops. How do I promote my work? When is it actually published? Um, concerns about copyright. Um, legitimacy of OER, how to do design beyond kind of the templates that um, Pressbooks may provide and collaborating with non UDOP authors and again students and authorship. So these are the sorts of questions that come up and this is what I'll be addressing tomorrow. I don't have the answers to all of those but I'll talk through my thoughts on um, those and sorry that I had to breeze through that so quickly at the end. Um, I'm not sure if there are more questions that have come up from um, webinar attendees. Yeah, we have a couple here that relate to the programmatic implications and questions about how you may or may not have yet built parameters around what kind of projects you'll support. So um, John loves the diverse examples that you shared. Do you have any limitations on content type of publication on your site? What about licenses or accessibility features or other guidelines that might go into a hosting agreement? And Anita also was curious about um, whether you have any requirements or restrictions about which licenses are allowed. These are great questions um, and definitely things I'll be talking through tomorrow. But the short answer is we don't have limitations currently. We have just finished writing our new updated user guidelines in terms of service for Pressbooks in which we say our investment in this tool is for OER. We strongly encourage a Creative Commons open license, um, but it is not a requirement um, at this time. Um, I think we're still figuring out our service model. And what I say is that um, I provide these workshops, but I don't provide consultation services for faculty if they're not looking at doing something that will be um, openly licensed and for a course. But that is always kind of a gray, fuzzy area in terms of how you actually um, deliver on that. Um, so that's also something I'm hoping to talk about tomorrow. Um, and so basic answer is no, we don't have a lot of firm guidelines. I think my approach has been sort of like get people on the network, get them interested, sell them on OER, um, sell them on these on open pedagogy and these different models um, and um, wait for it to kind of take hold. And so now I'm kind of moving into the what does that mean in terms of um, guidelines and a more strict sort of service model. Um, and so with Anita's question, we don't have restrictions on which licenses are allowed, but we um, strongly, um, strongly encourage and state that we um, strongly encourage an, an open license, so. Thank you. And David notes, UW is a large and well-staffed and resourced institution. Do you know of other less resourced universities that have been successful in this type of publishing program? 
That's a great question. Um, you know, uh, to me, uh, from my understanding, this is all still very new in terms of how um, different kinds of libraries and universities are um, supporting OER creation. Um, I sort of feel like we're, we're doing a very DIY, we can't provide a lot of support, we don't have a lot of staff who are dedicated to this, um, but I'm, I'm sure there are a range of ways in which people are thinking about supporting this or providing publishing, probably I'm guessing the OTN or um, folks at Pressbooks probably have more of an understanding of um, what that looks like at different kinds of universities, but not off the top of my head. Um, yeah, Lauren, I'll just agree with you that these are early days and I think people at all different kinds of institutions are still figuring out what it looks like and what can we provide and what do we want our publishing model to be and what are we equipped to do with the resources and capabilities we have. I do think mm -hmm. the DIY model of, hey, here's this tool, you know, let me know how it goes or, you know, kind of this um, iterative development together with particular faculty or projects is very common and popular way to feel out a publishing program. And if you are an OTN member, we do have a Pressbook sandbox space where you can sort of dive in and see, you know, what is this really like on the back end? Um, there's one more question here, which I think is another, you know, stay tuned or tune in tomorrow type question um, since we just have a few moments left. But um, I will just um, ask Lauren, now that you're a year or so into running these workshops, what changes are you planning as you move forward and any thoughts on scalability and sustainability? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think um, one of the things is just sort of like honing, um, particularly um, looking at questions that come up frequently. Um, I think there's still a need for this sort of introductory and advanced um, workshop to kind of get get people interested and familiar with the platform. But I think doing more around um, how to support open pedagogy, how to support um, student authored works, um, sort of more detailed um, content that we might be able to scale through, you know, recordings or um, things like that is something that we're looking at. Um, and I think that there's also this real desire from faculty to learn from others. Um, live so we i mentioned that we held like our first oer community meetup on zoom i think we'd like to do more of that sort of community building and getting instructors to sort of share with others and showcase projects that they're doing um and also i would really like to do more work which i'll talk about tomorrow um training um subject librarians um, at my institution even further to handle um oer types of questions and get more familiar with Pressbooks. so um Lots of things, changes to, to think about, but um, I'll sort of address some of those tomorrow. Super. Thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions and thank you Lauren Ray for your presentation today on teaching press books and programmatic implications. We hope to see many of you tomorrow and at other OTN Summit sessions. And until then, farewell. Thanks everyone. Thanks Karen.